So these activists that I was talking about from Colombia who I thought were doing such great activist work were really good at branding also. So they said, we're going to take this red tape. We're going to name our group No Red Tape, which is going to be about, um, you know, all the red tape that students who bring cases to the university have to go through all the paperwork oh come back for an interview well this guy said you said this and now we need to do another interview could you fill out this form um but they used it also to symbolize a silenced woman Vanessa Gregoriadis is an award-winning journalist and author. She is a contributing editor at the New York Times Magazine and Vanity Fair, specializing in pop culture, youth movements, and investigatory journalism. In 2007, she received the National Magazine Award for Profile Writing, and in 2012, she was a finalist for the Mirror Award. Her work has also appeared in several anthologies, including the Best American Magazine Writing, and she has been featured on MSNBC, CNN, and Dateline, among others. Blurred Lines, Rethinking Sex, Power, and Consent on Campus examines the issue of sexual assault on college campuses, drawing on Gregoriadis' time spent traveling to schools and speaking with students, administrators, parents, and researchers to uncover what's really going on and how it should be addressed. The Chicago Tribune calls Blurred Lines fair-minded and informative and praises Gregoriadis for seeking out the nuances and complexities of the issue. We're very pleased to bring the discussion to Harvard Bookstore tonight. Please join me, join me in welcoming Vanessa Gregoriadis. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate that. <laughs> Um, so my book is about the new rules about uh, the new rules of sex on campus. Um, I thought there was a lot of misinformation flying around uh, on the web and in conversation. And somebody who was a relatively unbiased observer, who was not an activist, but also no kind of rape apologist, needed to go back to campus and try to figure out what was going on. So um, the overarching theme of the book is a return to ethical sex, the idea that universities today are trying to promote and kids are actually listening to this idea of trying to have sex with compassion, thoughtfully, caring about the partner, something, doing something that creates more self-esteem versus less self-esteem so that people don't walk out of a hookup feeling used. Um, that's where I think we're landing today, but it has been a very long ride, and I'm gonna start describing my personal ride, um, which began with this cover story that I wrote for New York Magazine in September 2014. So um, it's entitled, A Very Different Kind of Sexual Revolution on Campus, and I'm sure some of you recognize Emma Solkowitz, um, who uh, was nicknamed Mattress Girl, which was not a nickname that she uh, enjoyed and she thought it was quite pejorative um, for what she was doing, which was a fairly serious art project. Um, so in the summer of 2014, I decided to write a story for New York Magazine about, um, about uh, sexual assault on college campuses, which was starting to really break into the mainstream as a major news item. And I thought, well, I'll write about Columbia since, you know, I see that a lot of stuff is going on here. They seem to have a big activist group. Um, they're doing direct action where they're going to prospective student days and handing out flyers saying Columbia protects rapists. Um, you know, a lot's going on here and let me find some people to talk to. So I spoke to a number of different survivors and Emma was one of them. Um, and we met for tea in a cafe called French Roast, which is in Greenwich Village, which sadly just closed after you know many decades in, in, uh, in the village as everything is closing um, for the rapacious uh, real estate tycoons to take over New York City. And um, she said to me, you know, let me tell you something, I'm gonna carry this mattress around and I'm gonna carry it around until Columbia expels the boy that I said raped me or until I graduate. And I said, oh my God, that's crazy, but that's kind of genius. Like that is really a genius idea 
tell me when you're doing that. I'd love to come up and see that. That sounds really great. Little did I know that, you know, in a matter of weeks, I was going to turn on the TV and there was Emma on TV and on Vice and on every news outlet from like Al Jazeera to being in the Times a dozen times with this mattress, which went um, viral. And, you know, it, what she was doing, which was this idea of taking a private suffering and making it public, um, showing the burden, saying, we can all carry this burden together. This is a big mattress. And if four people carry it and everybody gets one side, that's the lightest way for me to carry this burden. So it was a community project, a participatory project, and, you know, just really hit the zeitgeist at that moment. So um, I began working on this book, and I started to realize that you know the central issue with sexual assault is that women don't speak about it, and men don't see it. And um, I wanted to know more about that. Why? Why is it that women have been so ashamed, and that men have closed their eyes to it, and have really maintained a posture, in fact, that it it doesn't really happen, which is something that is starting to change and guys are starting to really accept this reality um, just you know, from the work of a lot of the activists that I write, wrote, write about in the book um, were instrumental in making this happen over the last few years. So there has been like a wide cultural shift. So um, this is the uh, st statue of Alma Mater, which is Athena in academic um, garb. And um, it's a Daniel Chester French sculpture. Um, I think he did John Harvard also and the uh, Lincoln Memorial. And um, this is the main symbol. If anybody's been to Columbia University, you know that this is in the middle of the quad um, on the steps of Lowe Library. And it's really the focal point on campus. So these activists that I was talking about from Columbia, who I thought were doing such great activist work, were really good at branding also. So they said, we're going to take this red tape. We're going to name our group No Red Tape, which is going to be about, um, you know, all the red tape that students who bring cases to the university have to go through all the paperwork, oh, come back for an interview. Well, this guy said, you said this, and now we need to do another interview. Could you fill out this form? Um, but they used it also to symbolize a silenced woman um, on this topic. In the book, I also talk about their um, effectiveness in silencing universities um, later on in the movement when they figured out that universities couldn't really talk back about some of the things that they said they did publicly because of federal privacy regulations. So the media became a really, really good tool for these women to, and you know, primarily women, to, um, to get their stories out there without the university rebutting. So this is an early, uh, early um, rally. Um, the students were really angry that the deans were um, the ultimate decision makers. The academic deans were the ultimate decision makers um, on cases of sexual assault at Columbia. Um, this is a student bringing her own mattress. These are the um, shiny blue uh, bed bug free mattresses that Columbia supplies to its students in its dorms. They're all extra long. Um, because you know there might be a really tall boy or t I guess tall girl, but they're like six, you know, plus six plus 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 um, feet long, and um, uh, students were bringing these mattresses in solidarity with Emma to rallies out from you know the elevators of their high-rise dorm rooms. Um, this is a, uh, a rally where 28, um, stu 28 mattresses um, were donated to Columbia students. Um, I'll get into why there were 28 a little later, but uh, the organizers, these Uber organizers, um, designated one mattress for each different student group that was willing to come and support Emma. So there was the Students for Justice and for Palestine, various political groups, the Queer Army, the Swing Club was one of them. And this is a very typical um, slogan of you know this this era of activism: "Don't rape." Um, let's forget, don't get raped. That's not really that doesn't need to be part of the um, message today. Let's let's put the focus on the people who are doing the behavior versus the um, way that this would be impacted. Um, 
there's another rally. And at the end of this rally, um, all these Uber organizers took everybody and marched across the quad and went to Columbia President Lee Bollinger's house and they used that red tape to put up their theses about what they wanted, all the different like administrative rules they wanted changed and they wanted Emma's attacker to go back on trial and everything like that and then they said, everybody throw down their mattresses in the front lawn here. But because they were like so organized, they were like, let's stack them really neatly. So they stacked them neatly and they left them there for him. So where did this all start? So this didn't happen in a vacuum, um, clearly. So uh, the underlying, you know, federal statute um, that tells universities that they need to deal with sexual assault on campus and make sure that their students are safe is Title IX. Um, Title IX was, okay, so it reads, no person in the United States shall on the basis of sex be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any educational program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. So that means if you're a university that gets some federal financial assistance, which almost all of them do, um, you cannot discriminate on the basis of gender. So Richard Nixon actually um, signed this into law. He was interested in um, signing into law um, something that would postpone the court orders to integrate um, schools by busing. But then some progressive activists slipped this in and he, he let it go through. So we all know that that protects with sports, you know, that, that, that women's sports teams should have the equivalent um, equipment, which they don't usually, but we know that that's part of Title IX. Um, sexual harassment, also part of Title IX. But no president before Obama really was able to understand the full breadth of what Title IX could do for sexual assault on campus. And he broadened um, the obligations of the universities quite, quite um, substantially. Um, Joe Biden, um, who was really interested in cementing his legacy as a, you know, uh, an advocate for women, not somebody who let Clarence Thomas on the Supreme Court, um, joined him and became very active in this, as I'm sure some of you know. But nothing really would have happened if it was not for the students themselves. So before these students at Columbia, probably, I mean, maybe they were just freshmen or hadn't even entered school. Um, Alexandra Brodsky here um, was one of the founders of Know Your Nine, and she and other students, particularly from um, Tufts, Amherst, uh, Yale, um, they began to organize and speak to legislators about the problem that they saw on their campuses. They were also joined by this by End Rape on Campus, um, co-founded by these two women um, who were uh, just graduates of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And um, they uh, were also the protagonists of The Hunting Ground, if you've seen that. But um, in this world, they're really known as like incredibly effective behind the scenes power brokers. Um, they um, are the best PR team for um, campus sexual assault, anti-campus sexual assault that there is. They um, talk to reporters all the time. Um, early on, they read campus newspapers, online essays. Any time a survivor would come out and say, this is what happened to me and my school didn't do me right, they would contact that person and they would try to get that person in touch with a reporter. So here they have a, a map behind them. Um, they have different, you know, dots for, for the schools that they're working on targeting. Um, another thing that was a great tool for these activists was the um, federal investigation called a federal complaint to the Office of Four Civil Rights, which is the office that deals with this. So here's an early example, Ohio State, Michigan, these are 55 schools under investigation, there are now over 300 schools that are under investigation. And the activists that I just mentioned were also very involved in helping survivors craft those and send those on to the federal government. And Obama really, you know, responded in kind, had his Office for Civil Rights come in, do a huge investigation at many schools, although now, you know, the list is so long. And we can talk about the 
news that came out today, which is that Betsy DeVos is not going to be um, following up on a lot of that. So when I started to work on my book, I thought, well, where am I going to go first? So I went <laughs> to Wesleyan University, which is where I went to school in Middletown, Connecticut. And um, I began interviewing um, a lot of women uh, at the school about um, you know, what it was like to be there today. Um, you know, I found that they, a lot of them looked a lot like they used to in 1995 when I was there, because there's this kind of 20 year nostalgia cycle that was coming back around. The school was a wash in like Doc Martin's boots, velvet chokers, Converse high tops, plaid flannel shirts, shoulder slung mini backpacks. Um, Sonic youth patches are no longer sewn to the backpack's front pockets. Instead, since water, plastic water bottles are banned around these parts, these pockets often dangle a carabiner steel canteen. Not only do these students look the same, they also talk urgently about many of the same issues that we did, in particular sexual assault. Um, economic inequality, destabilization in the Middle East, access to guns, no, the students here don't talk about that much. Racism, sexism, gay rights, trans rights, and sexual assaults, these topics are constant. So this is one of the women who was very involved in the activism there. She uh, carried a mattress in solidarity, or her group did, um, with Solkowitz the same day that um, many students did from around the country. But the way they talked about sexual assault, I started to realize, was a little bit different than the way that we did. Because they didn't want to talk about the patriarchy so much, and they didn't want to talk about civil rights as much. What they really wanted to talk about was morality. Debates about what is consensual and what is not, what type of sex is ethical and what is immoral, are essential to life here today. There's a difference between illegal and unethical, one of them told me. Life is not about doing whatever you can do. It's about not doing what is traumatic to the other person. So um, the next place that I went was Syracuse University, which I thought was like a counterpoint to Wesleyan. Um, I thought it was close because it was in New York, but it's actually like five hours away from New York City. It was very far and it was extremely cold. Um, so it was <laughs> perhaps, I, somebody said to me, you should have gone to Ole Miss. And I was like, yeah, I should have gone to Ole Miss. Um, so I hung out with the sorority sisters. Um, and the sorority sisters had a different way of looking at sex. Um, so I'll introduce you to Blackout Blonde. Um, that's her uh, pseudonym. Um, but she, uh, you know, her, her opinion was basically divergent from the people at Wesleyan. Um, hookups are fun, she told me. After all, why, if they weren't, why would so many people have them? At a time when every type of music has been discovered and every pierced and tattooed subculture brought into the commercial fold, semi-anonymous or mostly anonymous sex with someone you barely know is a wild experience, one of the few forms of rebellion left for youth in America. The, m the morning after quarterbacking with friends is part of the fun too, like the old actresses on, or the, the actresses on the old HBO show Sex and the City gossiping about the previous night's encounter over brunch, except these girls talk mostly through oblique or overt references to hookups on social media. This generation's version of talking to your girlfriends over brunch. At least on the surface, Blackout Blonde was pro-girl, admonishing frat brothers for being cheap and serving warm Keystone beer at parties because they know girls will dry hump each other on the speaker system no matter how little they spend on liquor. But, um, the, but she does ultimately recount some experiences that belie her pro-hookup line. One time when she was making out with a Sigma Alpha Epsilon brother in an alleyway behind a frat party, he started to squeeze and manhandle her too aggressively. She took off a heel with one hand and hit him on the head with it, then ran down the stairs. As she descended, she called a friend and yelled into the receiver, I'm like Cinderella escaping the prince. Another night had a murkier, more troubling denouement. She was hanging out with a fifth year s senior, a hockey player at his house, but all she can remember is doing keg stands to a Taylor Swift song. I was a sophomore and he was so much older and that made me really like him and think he was cool, but I, I don't know what happened that night, she said. 
In the morning, she woke up in bed with him wearing his boxers. She couldn't find her clothes at first, and then she looked between the mattress and the wall and saw her outfit sandwiched there. That was a weird place for her clothes to be, unless the two of them had hooked up, she thought. Clothes didn't usually get smashed between a mattress and a wall unless someone pushed them hard off the bed in the middle of sex. The guy kept saying, don't worry, I was too drunk last night to screw Blake Lively, okay? Acting all, don't flatter yourself. Well, A, I appreciate the comparison to Blake Lively, but B, I think he at least tried. She grimaces. After a ton of searching, I found my phone and I was out of there. I was even in such a rush, I forgot one of my layers at his house and I was pissed because that was a nice top from Urban Outfitters. I ask if she thinks of herself as a rape survivor. No way, she says, taking a swig of wine. As far as I'm concerned, there's only one person to blame in that situation, and his name is Jose Cuervo. So, so this woman said, girls just like to party. That's what it is. That's what's happening. Um, but at the same time, an interesting study came out uh, of a private university in upstate New York um, with a number of students that exactly matches Syracuse that showed that one in six freshman women, a really, really rigorous survey, one in six freshman women were being sexually assaulted on campus, either by physical force or the threat of physical force or because they were passed out. So it's hard to kind of square those two things. Um, part of the problem here began that um, this is a poster from Stanford's um, graduation. So rape is a very powerful language, right? It's a word that people, that people really you know, want to use if they think it fits. If it seems like rape, then it is. And there's no reason to use another word. Um, this became rhetoric that was very appealing. Um, so what to expect when you're sexually assaulted? Let's just call it rape, right, on campus. But there was a broadening of this term. It wasn't only rape that people were concerned about. And actually, this is pretty interesting because there were you know, some things that were just an environment that women had to live in on campus that was like just an environment like you don't have to live in anyplace else. Um, this is a frat with um, their signs out from the beginning of school. And as I talked to more women, I found um, you know, a lot of women who were thinking about this but hadn't called it sexual assault yet didn't really know what to call it. Um, interviewed another woman from Syracuse who said to me, I've never felt scared with a guy. I've definitely felt pressured. My problem has always been that I didn't know how to say no. I didn't know when I wanted to say no, and I didn't know how to, and I felt bad saying no, which is so stupid. I guess I should say it wasn't even like I wanted to say no. It's just that I didn't want to say yes. It's not like I was totally opposed. I was thinking, I don't want him to think I'm not interested in all, but I'm not in the mood and I'm kind of drunk. Let's just get it over with because I'd rather be watching TV. So people started to think like, well, okay, there's a lot of different things going on here that seem really funky. We can use the language of rape to talk about them, but the truth is, is that it encompasses all different kinds of behaviors. So everything seemed to be going pretty well and everybody was talking about this a lot in the media and then something happened. And this is the Rolling Stone story, um, which depicted a uh, very violent gang rape on the UVA campus in a fraternity and was very quickly um, debunked and shown to be um, mostly a falsehood, as far as we know. Um, and this really changed um, the way a lot of Americans perceived this subject. Um, it really reinforced a lot of the bad old ideas about women lying um, and became really like a Duke lacrosse scandal um, of the mid 2010s. Um, so the women that I interviewed at Columbia and also at Wesleyan, some of them called themselves the witches, which is like something that, you know, young women like to call themselves and you know they possess sorcery to upend societal orders they're also like unfairly victimized um you know that's that's something that they were using to apply to themselves 
But as this idea that women lie um, that was kind of brought out into the open by the Rolling Stone piece began to gain some purchase, we started to hear about some other people who wanted to use that term, and they were the boys who felt that they had been falsely accused. So one of them said, this is a witch hunt, no different than the Salem witch trials or McCarthyism. A fear has been sold to the country that every man is a potential rapist. This is now an American truth, just the way communists infiltrating and taking over our country was a truth of McCarthyism. For our American boys today, it's guilty before innocent. This, this was the idea, it wasn't like, complicated because rape is a powerful world word but being applied in some arenas that everybody might not accept it was just straight you know cut and dry it's a lie um so this is a mom from the universe of a son from uh, the University of North Dakota who really led the charge um, among some moms who felt that their boys were falsely accused. Um, and she is a history teacher and she um, was a former uh, leader of her Fargo um, uh, teachers union and she's a very, very good organizer on her side. She and um, the mom of this boy, who's one of the only boys who's come out with his own um, name from Auburn University, um, began also speaking to the media and bringing their stories more to the fore. So there was a bit of a shift in the national discussion here. And then Donald Trump was elected. <laughs> and suddenly, uh, I started to learn that, first of all, a lot of the country really wasn't down with what these girls were saying because I live in New York City and am a progressive and my friends are progressive and my family's progressive and I thought, this is amazing. This is just going to roll out across the country. This is the best feminist moment since, you know, 1972. It's just, it's, it's going to keep going. And meanwhile, we learned that indeed Donald Trump, who was accused, as we all know, of um, you know, multiple sexual assaults, really, most people thought of that as boys will be boys, and he was elected. And I feel bad putting up this picture now, because I have to say, <laughs> Betsy DeVos today um, did comport herself well. She gave a major speech, the first time I think anybody has seen her um, speak at length, cogently, um, with a real point of view, not talking about potential grizzlies. Um, she very much knew what she was talking about. I very much think she's wrong, but she went to George Mason University and went to the Scalia Law Center. And um, she was put there by the Federalist Society um, and the conservative lawyers and libertarian lawyers who are pushing her to scale back all of these protections around Title IX were there, helped her get there, and I'm going to assume helped her figure out what to say. But she gave a very good speech, and she was very clear on what she doesn't like that she sees happening. Um, we heard a lot about due process. But we also heard a lot about um, the need for equal protections for boys because there's a kind of morality to that. Maybe reverse discrimination is part of the idea. She has two girls and two boys and really feels like she's caught in the winds of this issue and just really wants to be fair to everybody. Um, I think we can assume, though, that her uh, leader for the Office for Civil Rights, which again is the group that deals with all those federal investigations, deals with the transgender bathrooms, anything to do with discrimination, Candace Jackson has a very thought out point of view here. Um, she's holding her book called Their Lives that she wrote about the um, accusers of Bill Clinton. You may have noticed her from the debate um, where um, there was a press conference before the debate, and the three accusers of Bill Clinton came with a lawyer who's kind of like a conservative Gloria Allred. That is Candace Jackson there on the end. Um, so she's now in charge of this whole situation. Um, she has said that the Trump victims are, are fake victims, though. So. so. So now we're in a time when, um, this is actually graduation day, uh, when Emma graduated. She did bring her mattress, even though um, the president of Columbia sent an email before the uh, ceremony saying to all of the students about to graduate, 
Um, please do not bring large objects that could create some discomfort in others. But she brought the mattress anyway. Um, and that day, um, some band of tricksters, um, conservative, we assume, uh, wheat pasted all over Columbia's campus these um, posters. So this is the shot from my New York Magazine cover, um, obviously with an extremely different headline. But the movement continues on. There is a bit of a silver lining. Um, these ideas that were pretty freaking marginal <laughs> um, are now in the culture and everybody, you know, from the sororities to high school students to, you know, moms around the country are interested in learning about what the parameters for consensual sex are, what they should call sexual assault, what they should speak up about, what they should not be ashamed about. This is a post-Kaiser um, Family Foundation study of a thousand recent and current four-year college students. Um, so they're talking about consent, and they have some interesting, although their ideas are at loggerheads, and it is interesting that only some of them think one thing and some of them think the other thing, so there is some chaos still going on. Um, at the bottom, we can see that you know, one of the big new ideas on campus is yes means yes, right? This idea of consent needs to be active, silence is not consent. This is particularly because um, people being passed out and being victimized is a, a big thing on college campuses. So um, many experts thought to themselves, like, let's, well, let's just make this clear. Like, let's not say, well, she didn't say no, I didn't know she was passed out, which is basically what Brock Turner's defense from Stanford was. Let's say, you need to get a yes. Um, so here we have these students, 77% of them saying that, that they believe no means no is not enough. You know, this is what we're, where we're at right now. Consent is a zeitgeist word, means something different to everybody, but students like it, they're cottoning to it. It's a complicated concept. Um, undergraduates are really interested in this and defining it for their generation. So. You know, I think there is a, some reason to be optimistic as well. So, okay. so um, does anybody have any questions? Okay. <laughs> so, I mean, this was one of my questions. You know, early on, um, I said to an incredibly radical activist that I was having lunch with, like, well, why don't they just go to the police? And she just looked at me with such a look of disdain, and she was just like, you just don't get it. So here's, here's the reason. A, the police are really not good with prosecuting, with, 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 you know, investigating rape. And then DAs do not want to take on murky, weird rape cases, right? The police know that there's a defense. And what's the defense? Consent. I had consent. I had it, right? Most of these cases don't involve a lot of physical violence to the point where people are severely bruised, you know? Um, they're really hard cases to make. And the district attorneys look at these cases as a potential political problem, right? And they know they're not gonna win them anyway. So it's really hard to say that they should go to the police. Um, you know, the part that I think is worth being honest about is that, you know, there's some of this stuff, as the woman at Wesleyan said, it may not actually be criminal, but it is immoral. And college is a place where you're learning to be a moral citizen, and you should be held to a different standard. Um, so I think it would be great if we could retrain a lot of police. I'm not saying that the campus courts are without flaw, because they clearly are, but we've also now spent five years since Obama really told everybody to start dealing with this with immense amounts of money being poured into it. I mean, Harvard in particular has, has really come forward and poured a lot of money into it. And employees, and it's a big institutional thing. And you can't just, you know, cancel that out. At this point, we need to play that out and see if we can make them work. Mm -hmm. Yeah.
Yeah. I mean, I think that Harvard is doing, yeah, I mean, I believe what Harvard's doing is exactly right. I mean, a lot of my book is at Wesleyan, and Wesleyan co-educated their fraternities while I was there. And um, that was, you know, a really big deal, even though you would think, why does Wesleyan have fraternities? Nobody in the NESCAC has fraternities. What's going on? Actually, you know, Wesleyan was one of the few uh, holdouts there, and um Many prior presidents had tried to get rid of it, of them, and, and not been able to. And the sexual assault issue has been a really, really excellent cudgel against these fraternities. Like the, you know, it's undeniable that if you have institutions on campus that are about cemented gender norms, and we know that assault has a lot to do with toxic gender norms, that those are going, and we know that universities have pushed alcohol off campus as much as possible. You know, you're going to get in real trouble. You, you got a keg in a dorm? Forget it. You're done. They, they, the alcohol has been pushed to these completely male-controlled spaces. And it is dangerous. I mean, it's, I, you know, the data shows like it doesn't happen at the frat party, but a lot of assaults are happening after the frat party. So you have to connect that to the environment that people have just gone through, and also, you know, the binge drinking that continues to be like a pretty major campus issue. Yeah, I think the issue is, is that the university courts are really a sideshow here, right? I mean, across the country in 2014, there were 6,000 cases um, in four-year colleges. Like, I crunched the numbers, and there was like 6 million guys, 6,000 cases. 6 million guys were in, you know, and, and guys are the ones, even though they're male victims, obviously guys are the ones who are brought up on assault charges. Um, uh, you know, six million boys at four universities and about 6,000 cases. So, you know, it's a really minor number of people who are willing to come forward about sexual assault and go to the university. We have a weird sense that it's like happening all the time, but it's not really. Um, and it, it has, you know, the court system is necessary because there has to be some mechanism of punishment, right? Otherwise, you know, you set up your standards, but who's going to uphold them? So I think they're trying. I think they're making like a really good old college try at, at making them work. But I mean, what we heard from Betsy DeVos today is basically that she wants to cut them off at their knees. She wants to um, establish centers where I'm assuming there's going to be ex-cops um, and, you know, like f people who've been involved in criminal justice and those regional centers will take care of the court, the, the um, cases and they'll be completely out of the university. Um, and so my question to her is what, what cases are they going to take? Are they, are they going to take the cases with the bruises? Because I don't think they're going to like the other ones, you know? So then you get into to what you're saying, which is, you know, community responsibility. Well, there's no community responsibility anymore if those cases are in Springfield decided by cops. You know, that's, that's a kind of weird idea that she had. <laughs> um, I mean, people are trying to solve this really intractable problem, so I'm not sure that her, like, just kind of tossed off idea that nobody ever heard before is the right one. Yeah, I mean, look, private university could do whatever it wants, right, essentially. But the, um, the, the guidance that will come forward from that Office of Civil Rights that will say, we strongly encourage you to do it this way. We strongly encourage you to use a higher burden of proof. I mean, you know, they're just going to try to bully colleges the way that they feel they were bullied by Obama. Particularly religious institutions and Christian institutions were really offended that Obama was telling them that they needed to set up um, courts around sexual assault. And they, uh, you know, they were like, well, we have abstinence on this campus. Um, and oh, no, you can't. Uh, oh, that girl, she was really drunk. Well, you have an honor code. We have an honor code on this campus. Maybe that 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 girl should be prosecuted in our campus court for her drinking, too. And Obama said, no, you can't do that. So they were there is some real tension going on there between you know, the Obama administration and the Christian colleges who see any encroachment on their religious liberty as, you know, something that they really, they're trying to, you know, 
make their own rules. So, um, you know, it's hard to know at this exact moment. It seems that experts think that most schools will just continue with Obama's regulations because who's going to be in power in three and a half years? They don't know. They're not going to spend many more millions, re, you know, recreating us, destroy this system, make another system. Oh no, let's destroy that one, recreate another one. You know, it's 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 too many like pieces of red tape, to be honest. It's a university, right? There's memos flying everywhere about this stuff every day. So I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, you know, the tricky thing that she did today is she opened up, um, this is a little bit like too granular, but she opened up this guidance for something called a notice and comment period, which means that it could become more of a strong regulation than just a, we strongly encourage you. So she's going to try to kind of do that. So I don't know. We'll have to see. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, um, faculty members hate that. Um, I mean, we're in this incredibly weird position where we have 90% of humanities professors are liberals, and yet there's been a lot of talk amongst those professors about not totally trusting students on this topic, not totally trusting the administration. They're really confused about it. They're really angry they have to be mandatory reporters. Like they're, they're just like not sure what to do. I mean, a professor-student relationship should be like a doctor-patient relationship. Um, there is no reason that um, a, a professor should have to like receive, you know, some confession from a student, and then go to the Title IX office and open a case for a student that doesn't want a case opened. I mean, I'm sorry. Like some things should still be off limits from like administrative tentacles, you know. So yeah, that's what I think. I mean, the problem is, is that this issue is so politicized, you know? So when I met with the moms of the accused boys, they said to me, they were in DC to go lobbying. And they said to me, we just want a seat at the table. You know, we want Kirsten Gillibrand to let us come and talk. You know, we are our stakeholders. How come we're not at the table? And now kind of the reverse is happening, right? Is this idea that, um, you know, DeVos is only kind of paying lip service to the college survivors who are, you know, outside of George Mason University today saying, you know, don't protect rapists. And so, um, you know, s several of the women who were invited to, to speak with her in a private way were disinvited when they um, published some op-eds that she didn't like. So there's really, uh, you know, this is a major political hot potato, and sitting down, I think, is not in the cards <laughs> in the short term. Especially with just the university, because it, it yeah. bring the university, sure. I mean, I think that it should, it should happen in the university, too, but, you know, the, again, the universities aren't able to speak about individual cases publicly. So when you sit down, it starts becoming a very abstract conversation or about how many days until we could send this letter to a survivor saying her to fill out this form. Well, survivors say they want five days, and the university says it wants 60 days. And it becomes like a very technical conversation because nobody really talks about, well, what actually happened there, you know? Yeah. They can't, I mean, Harvard took the lead, I remember. Mm -hmm. made a pretty clear statement, no need for a professor to have right. sex with a student, doctor, patient. Yeah. You start somewhere. Yeah. And the police are not helping. Yeah. He's very clear. You mentioned a great lot of points. Yeah. But yet. Right. Yet right. So let's have this in. Right. Right. We'll, we'll attack each other. I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> we'll come out a lot of yeah. places, but. Well, that's also optimistic. Let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm happy to come and moderate, so. <laughs> all right, well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you all for coming. <laughs> Thanks. When so many people who have white privilege could care less, and you could be doing something else. <laughs> <laughs> well.
<clears throat> you know, the flip side of that actually is that I was very hesitant to write this book or write about this topic for that reason. Like, and, and again, that's why it's important to me to recommend the work of other writers, particularly writers of color who are writing about this, because um, my experience is limited. And I'm not going to try to tell anyone how other, I'm trying not to tell people how other people's subjective experience of this 